We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to Heritage Voices, episode 46. I'm Jessica Uquinto, and I'll be your host today. And today we are talking about protecting the Honuk Vitam. Before we begin, I'd like to honor and acknowledge that the lands I'm recording on today are part of the Nuch, or Ute People's Treaty Lands, the Dineta, and the Ancestral Puebloan homeland. So today we have Desiree Martinez on the show. Desiree Martinez is the president of Cogstone Resource Management and Tongva Tribal Archaeologist. She received her BA in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania and her MA in anthropology from Harvard University. She is also a co-director of the Pimu Catalina Island Archaeology Project. And you all, I'm sure, remember Desiree from the Working With Museums panel episode that we did, crossover episode with the Go Dig a Hole podcast. That was episode nine. And the SAA 2018 wrap-up episode, which was episode 17. And these will be in the show notes. And Cogstone and Desiree also provided us the recording space for the Cultural Landscapes panel SAA 2019 episode, which we were really sad that a last minute change of plans meant that she couldn't join us for that. So happy to have her on here today and finally get to do a one-on-one episode and hear your full story, Desiree. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. So, okay, let's get, let's get right to it. So what got you into this type of work? Well, actually it's a kind of interesting story and started early. When I was in fourth grade in California, you learn about the California missions. And part of learning about the California missions is learning about the indigenous people of the area. And so the mission closest to my home is the San Gabriel mission. And that's actually the mission that my community was forced to work at, which I can talk about later. And During that time, we made a trip to the Southwest Museum, which was one of the major only museums in Los Angeles that talked about indigenous people of California and the Southwest in general. And so when we were learning about Mission Indians, which is the term that was used for any Native American community members that were working at missions, and that was an identifier that was used to acknowledge those Native peoples, um, the docent at the Southwest Museum stated that the Mission Indians were extinct. And so for me, being a descendant of the Mission Indians or the Tongva people who were at the San Gabriel Mission, this was uh, a surprise to me and my family, of course, because we were still there. And (laughs) I got a lot of pushback from my classmates because when we were at the the Southwest Museum, they had dioramas of uh, what Indian life looked like you know, before and after contact. And one of the little dioramas was of these little, you know, Indian people basically half naked going about their business around the village and stuff like that. And so a lot of my classmates actually didn't believe I was native because I wasn't half naked living in a village like they used to in the past. And so from that experience, I knew and something had to happen and I needed to change that in the future. And then in sixth grade, I was introduced to archaeology and anthropology. Um, That was part of the curriculum. And of course, we were learning about Neanderthals and Lucy and all that kind of stuff. But then I realized that I should study archaeology and anthropology in order to kind of correct those incorrect facts about my community. And so that started me off on I wanted to be an archaeologist in sixth grade. That, I don't think I've ever, well, no, I remember, I think we've had one episode maybe where somebody figured it out earlier, but that is pretty, pretty dang early. (laughs) That is impressive. Okay. So after sixth grade, how did you uh, develop this, this interest in archaeology further? So, you know, the other thing too, that I, that I sort of forgot to mention, but also was a really um, big push was that my grandmother, who was the a person who was in charge of recording and collecting our, our, our native history, she would mm. cut out newspaper articles. And those articles would be of, you know, protests in the greater native community, 
you know, the longest walk, for instance, that happened in the 70s with the Navajo, you know, recognizing what had happened to them in the past, as well as just general things that affect the Native communities. And one of them was the destruction of our secret sites and archaeological sites, particularly as it related to the Gabriel and Tongva within our traditional territory. And so she would keep it in her Indian book. And it basically, you know, where all these articles were, and she would always wonder what could be done to make sure that these sites, our sites wouldn't be destroyed. And so that was, you know, when I learned about archaeology in the sixth grade, considering that archaeology is in archaeologists record or protect or, you know, save sites that you could use the discipline, you know, to do that. And so once I understood that that's what I wanted to do in archaeology, I actually went to our career center at my middle school and looked to see what I needed to do in terms to be an archaeologist. And I also looked at what colleges I should apply to in order to do archaeology. And so at the time on that card, it was the best schools were Boston University, Harvard, uh, University of Pennsylvania. And I think those were the top three at the time. So in the 80s or something like that. And so that's what I decided to do, that I was going to apply to those schools to be an archaeologist. And you literally hit two um, out of the three. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, and, it's, and it's interesting. So so one of the big stumbling blocks, particularly with any individual who happens to be from a marginalized community, but also I had the, the background of being first generation college student, being from a single family, low income. I hit all those little marks that it's hard for somebody from my background to get to college. And so when I got to high school, I was identified and participated in the Upward Bound program, which was through Harvey Mudd College. And the Upward Bound program is a trio program that gets federal funding in order to help um, low-income students that need help getting to college. And so with the help of the um, Upward Bound program, they prepare you, you know, to take all of the tests that you need to take and, you know, writing your personal statements and applying to college. But then they also have a summer program where depending on what your interests are for college, they'll send you to a program that meets your your interests. And so my second year in the program, which was the year before my senior year, they did an exchange between me and the Upward Bound, Upward Bound program at Utah State College, which is now Southern Utah State College, which is now um, Utah State University. And they had a archaeological field school that the school put together. So at the age of 16, I flew out to Utah to be at the field school. And that's the first time I actually participated in a dig. Wait, okay, just because I'm personally curious, where in Utah was that? We were in Hilldale, Utah, also known as Cedar City, Arizona. Yeah. So it happens to be the, it's a city that straddles the border. And it's also a city in which the fundamentalist Mormons. Yeah, it's Colorado City. That's what it is. Or Spring Creek. Colorado City. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Hilldale. Yeah. Sorry. No, I, I mean, I've actually been through that area quite a few times growing up in, in Arizona and then um, working up in that area for various different reasons. Yeah, that'd be a cool area to do to, to get that kind of experience. Yeah, it was definitely very interesting and, and eye-opening, uh, considering it was also my first time away from home Yeah, for any long extended period of time without any like, kind of family or anything around me and stuff like that. But it was also a very eye-opening experience, mm -hmm. um, particularly doing archaeological work in 110 <laughs> temperature yeah. in the middle of the desert type of thing. Yeah. So, Very um, different from LA, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah. And, and in the beginning, I actually like broke down. <laughs> I think it was heat exhaustion Aww. where I thought, oh my God, I can't, I yeah. don't like it because of the heat and stuff like that and being alone and stuff. And it's like, I can't do it. It's maybe I'll be a, maybe I'll be a paleontologist instead. Like I was coming up with different, you know, <laughs> scenarios, but as, as time went on and what really made this for me or, or solidified that this is what I wanted to do was that on the last day of the field school, I was in inside of one of a Pueblo room. And so I had been excavating out some of the, the wall fall mm -hmm. and last day, which always happens. I was 
there was a hearth. And so I'm cleaning up the floor, you know, to make sure it's pretty so we can take pictures. And I accidentally went through the floor <laughs> next to the hearth and I found a ceramic pot. Oh. And so then like, oh, well, now that you found the ceramic pot, then let's open it up a little bit more. They sort of already knew what was going to be. And then I, we dig, dug a little more and there was a pot inside a pot. And then inside the pot was the remains of a baby. And then we immediately covered everything up and said, we're not going to deal with it. Or they, they, they were having conversations with the, the tribes in the area. And so they had already made agreements that they wouldn't excavate ancestral remains without permission. So it was covered up. But for me, that was um, an important moment because when I was younger, I had a younger sister who passed away when she was nine months old. And so at that, and I actually wrote a poem about this, um, this moment. And I knew that that's what I needed to do was I needed to make sure that babies, children, ancestors are protected, that that's, that was my, what I needed to do. And so that's pretty much my, has been my focus, not only educating people on the Gabrielino Tongva history and its actual, and the history from the perspective of the community, but to make sure that our ancestors are, are kept in the ground. And if they're exhumed out of the ground, then they get put back. And, or if we have to move them, then, you know, I'm going to help in whatever way I can with whatever skills I have to make sure that they are respected and um, sensitively handled. That must have been a really intense experience at 16. I mean, were you able to, did you feel comfortable sharing any of that with, with your fellow students um, or professors or was it something? I didn't say anything about it until I actually wrote about it in a chapter of being and becoming indigenous archaeologists that was um, edited by George Nicholas. And it was something, but it's something that ca- that kept to my heart. And I actually, which was well, not kind of funny. I told my family um, at the time I was writing letters to my family and I would make fake newspaper articles about myself and my, and um, what I was doing in the field school. And so part of it was, you know, on the last day, Desiree finds, you know, X, Y, and Z. So my family knew about it, but I didn't talk about it to anybody else. And what, uh, what was your family's reaction to that kind of an experience? They didn't say anything about that particular portion of it. Exactly. But my family was not supportive of me becoming an archaeologist because of the history of archaeologists coming in and destroying our, you know, destroying our sites and um, uncovering our ancestors. They actually asked, why would I want to be a grave digger? And that's how they saw archaeologists was that, you know, that's what you're going to do is you're just going to go and dig graves, which is totally opposite of what I wanted to do, which I had to explain to my family. And of course, you know, they also wanted me to do, make something, you know, major in something that I make money in doctor, lawyer, whatever. Right. But I had a higher calling per se. And we finally that, came around. Yeah. I was going to say, has that, has that reaction changed through time? Um, sounds like it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, considering that the type of work that I do now and, you know, just keeps, you know, keep saying like, I, like I tell any native person is that I want to, I don't want to go dig up your ancestors. I don't want to even dig up my ancestors. I want to make sure they stay in the ground, but if somebody's going to do it, I'd rather somebody from my community know how to do it and do it the way it's supposed to be done. If it has to happen, you know, you have to have some, that way, you can make sure that it's that the ancestor is being taken care of. Yeah. Um, And what are some examples of, of situations where that, you know, types of situations, obviously where that has had to happen? Well, there's been a couple of times, for instance, and I talk a lot about this. um, One of the reasons why we developed the Pimu Catalina Island archeology span project in 2007 with um, Dr. Wendy Teeter, who is the curator for our, of archaeology at the Fowler Museum and Karima Kennedy Richardson, who is the associate curator at the Autry Museum, as well as Cindy Elvitre, who is also a Tongva um, leader. Uh, we all created the Pimu Catalina Island archaeology project so that not only can we, the Tongva community, reconnect with, with Pimu, 
because Pimu is considered sacred to our community, but also to help the Santa Catalina Island Conservancy, which owns, or should I say, manages 85% of the land on Catalina and help them protect the cultural resources that they have out there. And so there's been times when they are making sure that the roads are up to snuff and they're doing grading that they come upon cultural resources. And a couple of times it's happened where ancestors have been exposed. And so we have a relationship with them that if something like that happens, that we will go out and volunteer to make sure we put either some type of protection in place. And of course, this is always in consultation with the Tongva community, figure out a way to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And so that happened once where uh, Ancestor was found in the middle of the road. And there was, because we always want to make sure that the Ancestor stay in the ground, we asked if there was a way that the road could be moved. And unfortunately, if they move the road, they'd be into the drainage. If they move the road to the other side, they'd be in the middle of the site. So at that time, we, the community decided the best way would be to actually remove the ancestors from the road and then rebury them some, somewhere else. And so we actually ended up doing that. And then another time, ancestor w- um, was found in the road. And luckily, we were able to have that piece of the road decommissioned and covered up with rock and dirt so that the ancestor stayed in the ground and then any artifacts that were there with the ancestor were also reburied and then that way you know no they got to they didn't have to move so you know it just really depends on what what you can do and but it's always been in collaboration with the Tongva community here here's what we can do here's what we can't do what do you guys think well and we're already at our first break point (laughs) which is nuts so we are going to be back in a minute and definitely talk more about the the pimu catalina island archaeology chris webster here for the archaeology podcast network we strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world one way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once we do that through the use of zencaster that's z-e-n-c-a-s-t-r zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest just send them a link to click on and that's it zencaster does the rest they even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R dot com and use the code HEVO, H-E-V-O. America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By honoring your sacred vocation of education, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. At Grand Canyon University, our online bachelor's, master's, and doctoral education degree programs allow you to balance online coursework with observational and hands-on experience in the field. Find your purpose at GCU. Private. Christian. Affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zax Rewards app. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. Okay, we're back. And we left off when you were after your field school and you were 16. So from there, you know, you knew for sure that this is really what you you wanted to do after the the last day. So you went to to the University of Penn and yep. how did it from there? University of So like the University of Pennsylvania, even though it was a good school for archaeology, it was the worst school to go to to focus on California archaeology, which was something that I didn't even think about. It 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 wasn't even something that came to mind um, for me in terms of of looking at places that focused on the areas that you would be interested in. And that's something that I now tell to up and coming when I do recruiting or lectures for high school students that are looking into undergrad, you know, I tell them always think about, you know, you may, you can go to college and be undecided, but think about 
what they offer you and if there are disciplines that you're interested in, do they have the faculty and or classes in those disciplines that are of interest to you? So even though the school was great in archaeology, like I think it was a plus and a minus for me to to, to go to, to Penn in that there wasn't anybody there that could guide me for California archaeology, prehistoric archaeology, but it also forced me to do my own research and do my own reading and tailor my classes when I had to do papers to tailor them to what I was interested in. And also it pen, which still does, kind of lacks a lot of um, Native American class or Native American focused classes. Mm -hmm. And so I actually cobbled together classes from a variety of different disciplines, for instance, folklore, folk life and religious studies that had classes that talked about Native communities and had them count toward my anthropology degree. And then I also did a independent study to kind of round out my interests. And one of my independent studies was to record my great aunt who went to Sherman Institute and record her experiences going to an innate American boarding school. So what's, what's of interest, I think, is my own doing my own research, re- reading everything that was out there written by anthropologists, ethnologists, um, archaeologists about archaeology in Tongva land, and then coming up with my own ideas and being skeptical of all of the theories that are out there. Uh, A lot of times when you're in undergrad, if you have decided to focus on a particular area, you're kind of guided and become a student of this archaeologist and you're kind of following in their footsteps. Whereas for me, I was kind of carving my own way, which then even now is great because I'm not forced to follow because I'm a student of somebody to follow the way that they think I'm always challenging the theories that are out there. So uh, as far as California archeology, span what would be the number one thing that you feel like you'd like to challenge with your career? Well, I've been challenging it. So one of the biggest things that you see when people are talking about the Gabrielino Tongva, you always see that they, The Cabrillon Tongva came into the Los Angeles Basin at 4,000 BP. And it's called the Shoshonean Wedge or Shoshonean Intrusion Theory. And so it's something, and I talk a lot uh, about this and I've written about this as well, is that this theory uh, occurred when Alexander Taylor, who was writing for the California Farmer, was a footnote in his writing. So he took an interest in Indianology. He liked to record things about Indian tribes in the state of California, whether it was straight from the native communities that he could find himself and or from other scholars. He would record all these little details. It could be language, it could be history about sites or everything like that. And so one of the little quotes or footnotes that he had in one of his articles was that if you look at the map, and look at the languages that Native people speak, particularly in Southern California, you'll see that there's a wedge of Shoshonean speakers in Southern California. So at the time, Chumash language was identified as Hokan branch of the Shoshonean language. Shoshonean is an old term that was used to identify languages that are now um, considered something different now. And so in the past, Chumash were identified as Hokan speakers. And then if you skip down Los Angeles and go into um, San Diego territory, there were also Hokan speakers down south. And so you see this group of Shoshonean speakers, which included the Gabrieleno, Luiseno, Serrano, um, Kuiya, that it seemed as if they came in and split the Chumash Hokan speakers from the other Southern Hokan speakers down below. And so looking at that map, he's like, that seems to be that the Shoshoneans wedged themselves in between these two communities. Of course, now the Chumash language is in its own separate language category, Chumashian. And all of the Shoshonean language are now considered um, part of a different language branch. But, a lot of other anthropologists, archaeologists, linguists saw that footnote 
saw the sim- same thing when they saw maps and ran with that theory. Uh, particularly Alfred Kroeber really stuck in, and did a lot of research. If you look at his research notes, talks about and trying to prove that there's this Shoshonean intrusion. And more recently, you have Mark Sutton who who talks about this Shoshonean um, wedge theory as well, trying to pick up on the differences in burial practices, the difference in subsistence patterns, et cetera, to prove that this happened. However, for the Gabrielino Tongva, that goes against our belief system. It, we were born in the land. We were born at Pavagna, which is our sacred emergence site, which partly resides on the current campus of University uh, California State University, Long Beach, as well as Rancho Los Alamitos. Basically, the, old, the whole Alamitos plain out there is where Pavogna resided. And so our stories is that we emerged from there and we've always been part of the land. We didn't come from anywhere else. And so I'm always trying to talk about and discuss that no one has ever questioned this theory or people are trying to fit the stuff that they're finding in the archaeological record to support this theory. And I always argue, you know, one, what happens when people replace other people? There's usually some type of evidence of warfare. It's never done quietly. And if somebody is coming from up north, so a lot of um, the theories, people, when they talk about the theories of talk about the Gabriel and coming from the Great Basin and then moving into these areas, there should be a change in the way that um, settlement patterns, for instance, as well as material culture. And the peoples of the Great Basin are using pottery. But the peoples that are living in Tongva territory were using stone, soapstone pots, soapstone that is gathered and harvest. Uh, harvested from Catalina as our cooking vessels, as opposed to pottery. So if you have a group of people who are moving from one area to another, they're going to be bringing what they know and how they live in their material culture. I remember asking an archaeologist when he was giving a presentation um, about archaeology in Southern California, and I went up to him and I was like, so what do you think about this, you know, the Shoshonean wedge theory? If people are, are coming in, you know, where's the proof in this? When you look at the archaeological record, you see cultural continuity through the layers, that you see small changes through time occurring. There's, there's quote unquote, evolution in place. And basically his response is like, why would somebody who is using pottery from one spot take and start to decide to use soapstone pops when they get to this area? And he said, well, they just got with the program, which is the dumbest response ever because they've been taught by their professors and by other archaeologists that they shouldn't question this theory because other people before them have questioned it and this really came about and we we talked about this in in um, one of the articles that we wrote we were able to help the Santa Catalina Island Museum with their NAGPRA compliance, which included repatriating ancestors and funerary objects back to be reburied. And during our research, one of the biggest things that is being used as evidence that there's a different group of people prior to 4,000 BP compared to 4,000 BP and on is base, based on, on head shape. So basically, craniometrics is being used that the people who lived in on both on the islands as well as what we now consider Tongva land had long heads. And those people that replaced them had short heads. And so, of course, this is a racist bias theory that has been disproven in all disciplines, including, you know, bioarchaeology. And you look at other archaeological practices around North America, and it's been disproven. And yet here you have California archaeologists still believing that because the skull shapes are different and change in time, that means you have a different group of people. Not even talking about material culture, talking about head shape. Yeah, yeah. It's the craziest thing, and no one ever questions it. And so during our, our NAGPRA um, compliance, we kind of reached deeper into, into the scholarly work. And in fact, Karima Kennedy Richardson is, is doing her PhD at University of Riverside on this, in that when people who have written about 
the differences of the populations before and after 4,000 BP, they are using measurements that were obtained from various collections, one of them being the Glidden Collection, which is the collection that um, the Santa Catalina Island Museum held. And then using those measurements, used it in their theses to show that there's two different populations. However, when you look at the ancestors that are in the Glidden Collection, they assume that the Glidden Collection had ancestors only from Tongva and Chumash territory. They believe that only two discrete populations were within his collections. Let's not talk about there's no time depth in the collections because Glidden didn't keep track of where he got the ancestors on the ancestors themselves. They may have numbers on their heads, but they didn't correlate to sites. Mm -hmm. And of course, back in the day when he was digging, um, early 1900s, to the 30s, he wasn't keeping track of stratigraphy or anything like that. So we couldn't even do relative dating or anything like that. So people were coming at this collection and assuming there's Chumash people and there's Gabrielino people and segregating all of the skeletal material and measurements based on those two ethnicities they assume were there. Mm -hmm. During our research, we actually found out that some of the ancestors, yes, there's Gabrielino, Tongva, and Chumash ancestors, but we also found the remains of an African-American, of an Asian person, a white person. And then we actually looked further, and it turns out that Glidden was buying remains from a company in Sacramento. And he was, these remains were coming from various mounds from the Sacramento Valley, which is Mindu territory. And then he was buying them and putting them in his display. So the collections that Glidden had had a mixture of people in it. So huh. if you're a researcher who assumes that there's only two populations there, any variation that you're going to see, you know, you're going to, you know, you don't take that into account. So there was many more ethnicities, those remains than, than had been previously known. So anybody who has based their research on those collections, pretty much, you know, though their theories and conclusions no longer are supported. Wow. <laughs> I did not know that much about California archaeology. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's funny how that happens too, where somebody will cite somebody and then they're citing somebody and then it goes on and on. And then, so everybody is saying the same thing, but nobody realizes that it all came from you know, one site or one person or, you know what I mean? Like that it just becomes this like thing that people take as doctrine and nobody ever even bothers to question, you know, definitely seen that in, in our areas as well. Exactly. And then plus there's other archaeologists thinking about Franz Boas, you know, way in the early part of the, the 20th century had already talked about how craniometrics and any type of measurements that you take of bodies and, and trying to think about ethnicities and, and ethnic origins that you can't rely on those measurements. He took measurements, you know, famous study of um, immigrants and their children. And, you know, the, the basic results is that the body is plastic, it, that yeah. it changes, that even though you might be from one particular ethnic background, because you have the children who are now living in an area where there's resources, food, you know, there's there's little to no stressors, they are larger than their parents. Yeah. So if you were to see the bones at the end of their lives, you wouldn't think they were related because right. their, you know, physical appearance is different. He stated that when? And we're still looking at and believing the Shoshonean wedge based on measurements of skulls. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like I don't, I don't understand. And and but it has a lot to do with you know if you're educated under that paradigm, you're not going to question your professor. They're supposed to know better than you. <sighs> but being a good scholar is you're going to go back to those original documents. You're going to go back and do your own measurements if you believe that the measurements are correct. That if that's the correct way of, of identifying ethnicity, you should go and do your own. You can't depend on somebody else. But that's the shortcut that people have taken, which then, you know, affects their their outcomes. Yeah. I mean, not to mention, you know, all of the, the connections to eugenics and overtly racist, you know, studies by the Nazis. And I mean, 
yeah, it's so far outdated. It's not even funny. Exactly. And it's, and it's also, you know, thinking about it too, is that there's a lot of stories out there that again, that, that we pushed out some unnamed tribe before the Gabriel Cano came in 4,000 PP. And a lot of people assume that's Chumash. And there's all of these the academic articles that talk about how wonderful and advanced the Chumash were, which is true there in terms of social complexity, et cetera. But that still social complexity was also happening in Tongva territory. And so I think a lot of it, when you look at archaeologists who are studying Southern California, because they're also, you got a, had a lot of information recorded from Chumash people during the, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, because they were still around as opposed to Gabrielino Tongva. I shouldn't say because they were still around. We were still around too, but we weren't readily seen as a population that was, that still existed in uh, practice traditional culture. That, scholars, you know, you go where the resources are, you go where the information is, and then you create your, your, your research based on what's available to you. How are you going to say anything about the Gabriel Tongva if there isn't any kind of data there that you can use? And so you get this belief that, you know, the Gabriel Tongva were, were less than or not as great as their cousins to the, to the North. And I think that has a lot to do with racism as well. Yeah, well, I mean, Western culture, complex means advanced, right? I mean, <laughs> yep. for some reason, we've decided that that inherently means good and the opposite inherently means bad when it means nothing other than they're responding to their environment or, you know what I mean? Like, or that's how they decided to be. I mean, there's no value of good and bad is just a reflection of Western culture, not the culture itself is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Yeah, Yes. Yeah, on that note, we are already at our, our second break point. <laughs> and when we come back, I'd, I'd definitely love to make sure we get to your experience in CRM because I know that there was listeners that were specifically um, really interested in, in hearing about experiences being Indigenous in CRM. So I want to make sure we get there. And God, we have we have way too much to talk about. We've got lots and lots of things <laughs> on the list that I'd love to hear about, but I don't think we'll get to it all. I'm, I'm sure we'll have you, you back on the show again after this uh, third segment. <laughs> so yeah, we'll be right back. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo saucy. Zaxby's. Back from our break. And now let's let's dive into what we were just uh, mentioning with this next step on your journey um, as a CRM professional. So we were just talking about your undergrad, creating your own course of study, essentially. And then what happened? Well, then I went to Harvard for a PhD in archaeology and... I ended up not completing the PhD, just stopping at the master's, do some to having to move back home to take care of my grandmother. And so while I was at Harvard, I was interested in a whole bunch of different things. Again, you know, using archaeology to protect the ancestors, which then also included dealing with NAGPRA or the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And, you know, trying to help my community in whatever way I could in order to, to make sure the ancestors are, are coming home. So I ended up working at the Peabody Museum as a curatorial assistant to get um, experience working with collections. And I had already been working with some collections when I was at Penn, but working in particular in terms of handling and, and helping to uh, pull items for tribal NAGPRA visits when I, when I was asked to do that. And then also, of course, uh, being very involved in the Harvard Native American program in terms of helping other students, both undergrad and graduates, students in whatever way, I, again, I could in terms of creating events and or mentoring or, or, or things like that. Uh, um, so when I moved back to California, 
I actually had a fellowship at Whittier College for two years teaching. And then when that ended, that's when I started to get into cultural resources management, mostly because I needed a job and needed to get paid. But also it was a kind of natural progression in terms of my career, considering a lot of the work that's being done in California, particularly in Southern California, is related to cultural resources management and getting my feet wet in that. So I actually did tribal monitoring first. So as a tribal member, going out and watching the archaeologists, making sure that they are doing their job correctly and keeping an eye out during construction activities to make sure that any cultural items or ancestors that might be found are, are being protected, identified correctly. And it just grew from there. So I went from a couple of different tribal monitoring jobs, uh, worked at the UCLA Fowler Museum for a little bit to help with the move that was happening of their collections at that time. And then also doing some consulting work um, in terms of helping various museums with various moves and consulting with tribal uh, peoples as well. And then I'm just all over the place. My experience from once I left graduate school and, and, and it all interrelates to each other in terms of, again, that, that major goal of making sure sites are protected, ancestors are not uncovered. And if they are, then they're being reburied and protected. Um, so I, you know, have the day job, then I have, you know, my side jobs in terms of side consulting jobs. And then, of course, in 2007, we create the Pimu Catalina Island Archaeology Project to, to more discreetly and, and handle the issues that are that are happening out on Santa Catalina Island. But we also wanted to train the next generation of archaeologists, considering the types of things that we found that a lot of the uh, cultural resource management people aren't trained on how to collaborate with Native American communities. This idea that consultation is something to be checked off the list, that you send a letter, you know, during the consultation under cultural resources management, and then that's it. We wanted to make sure that the up-and-coming archaeologists understand what it means to collaborate with Native people and to practice a different type of archaeology, which is an indigenous archaeology, something that um, a lot of practitioners in archaeology who have Native heritage as well as other non-Native people who have latched on to. Indigenous archaeology was first defined by George Nicholas when he was working with First Nations people, with indigenous archaeology being defined as archaeology practiced by, for, and with indigenous peoples. As time goes on, but thinking about how archaeology can't be practiced. If you're doing archaeology of indigenous communities, it can't be practiced correctly unless the indigenous communities are there at the table from the very beginning. And that's kind of the basis of how we started the Pimu Catalina Island Archaeology Project, is that no matter what, everything, all the research questions, everything that we do is something that is going to answer or help the Tongva community in some way any questions that the Tongva community has, that's what's going to be the basis for any of the work that we do. And that's how I practice my whole life, even in my cultural resources uh, management life, is making sure that the Indigenous communities have a voice, are heard, and that you're upfront about whether you're going to incorporate their recommendations or not. Um, so I'm always pressing agencies, like, just be truthful. If you're not going to do it, just tell them you're not going to do it. If you are going to do it, then you're going to make sure that you're doing it the right way. And so that's what drives my whole life is making sure that archaeology is not being, it's the colonial tool that it was created to be, but that it is something that can help the indigenous community thrive in their current circumstances. So how did you get connected with Cogstone then? Wendy Teeter at the Fowler was made the initial contact, or sh should I say, um, Sherry Gust, who was the president of Cogstone, had a previous relationship with Wendy Teeter and um, a professional relationship. And so I got suggested for a job opening that they needed uh, archaeological technicians um, in 2009 for a project. And so she hired me to, to do a project, project out in the Mojave. And then it went from there. 
And I've been at Cogstone ever since. And, and one of the things I actually didn't want to get into CRM in the beginning because a lot of the CRM firms that were in Southern California were very unethical. Again, not treating the Native American communities correctly. And I didn't want to get involved with uh, a CRM firm that didn't, that was like that, or they try to cut corners. When I decided to be uh, an archaeologist, I actually had a conversation with one of our tribal leaders, uh, Vera Rocha, who actually lived in my hometown and was a friend of my grandmother's. And, um, and this occurred when I was still an undergrad. And even though I had declared archaeology as my major, I wanted to make sure that what I was doing and going into was going to be of use to the tribe. And I had a long conversation with her and she said that you know, she, we needed a Gabrieleno archaeologist because she had gone on to many sites and had been invited to talk to archaeologists and, you know, trying to protect sites and stuff like that. She could never trust archaeologists, what the archaeologists were telling her because they were using all of this jargon that she didn't necessarily know. And so she never could feel, you know, she made the decision based on the information that she had in terms of how to protect or make recommendations, but she never really, you know, trusted the person that was talking to her. And she said, it would be great if there was somebody in the community that could speak that language so that they could, you know, look through all of the, all of the jargon that was being used. Cause you know, some archeologists are using the jargon in order to confuse yeah. and, you know, hide the real significance of a site and stuff like that. Right. It was well known in Southern California that, you know, some of the developers would pay um, archaeological firms money under the table not to find anything. Or if something was found, immediately cover it up so that, you know, you didn't have to deal with it. Because there are laws in California that if something is found inadvertently, you have to, there's these steps that you have to follow. But if you don't have anything, then you don't have to follow those things. And and she told me about this this, this history. And so I knew that I had to do something about it in that sense, and but making sure I wasn't aligned with a company that didn't play that way. And that was something very upfront that I had a discussion with my boss. It's like, this is the way I do my work. And, you know, if we're going to have a problem, then I can't work for you. I don't think a lot of people would go to their boss and who's, who's going to hire them and tell them, this is how I'm going to do it, you know, like challenge them on the first time. But because she, she already had a good relationship with a lot of Native communities. And I had already heard that, that I knew I, that, that, you know, this was a company that I would feel comfortable working for. I mean, it sounds like with Cogstone, with, so the late Sherry, who owned the company, mm -hmm. that, you know, she was someone that was really uh, responsive and understanding about the ethical way to do archaeology with tribes. Did you, I imagine, have have different experiences with other archaeologists in California? Or do you feel like in California that uh, people were pretty open and, and understanding to this way of doing things? Basic there, there, with the people that I've been in contact with, there was a lot of um, roadblocks, um, particularly being a woman, being a Native person, being an archaeologist, um, there's a lot of male archaeologists out there in the the field have been very condescending to me. And a lot of it has to do with they don't know where to place me because I'm Native, but I have arche I'm also an archaeologist, so I know what I'm talking about. But yet I don't have a degree, uh, uh, or should I say, have a PhD. I was going to say you have a degree. A lot <laughs> you got a couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I have, I've gotten a lot of pushback of, um, I remember one archaeologist, you know, when I was going about how, you know, they're ignoring Native communities. I, I, I don't know, I was going on my, one of my, not rants, but, you know, challenging what he's saying. And he's like, oh, you sound just like a disgruntled graduate student, Oof. you know, and he has a PhD. Or I remember, and in fact, this actually just came up as a memory on my Facebook, is that I was at a meeting in, uh, in a consul, tribal consultation meeting with an agency lead, uh, tribal representatives and the archeologist that had been hired. And the tribe had said that the transmission lines that were going over the sacred site is affecting that site use by the tribe, you know, for sacred ceremonies and stuff like that. And that if, you know, when you're in that spot, 
you know, you, the feeling that you get from that spot is being affected by the lines. And so the archaeologist said to me, not to the tribal representative, was like, oh, well, you know, that feeling they're feeling is the energy that's coming off the transmission lines. It's not really sacred. And, you know, so in that instance, I was only an archaeologist. I was a fellow archaeologist and like, you know, hey, let's be buddy, buddy and discount what the native people are saying. Whereas I'm both, you know, like no one would ever have said that, you know, he didn't say it directly to the Native American representative, but he said it to me. Right. You know, so there's always these blurring of lines. And again, people don't know how to deal with me. And I have all of these different hats. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, in fact, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to, to go into archaeology is because, and get degree, a degree, because a lot of our tribal leaders, even though if they've been doing cultural resources for f- now almost 50 years, their knowledge is being discounted because they don't have a degree in archaeology. And, you know, why should our, our elders and our cultural leaders who have just as much education in terms of our cultural resources be discounted because of their knowledge. And so I wanted to go and get degrees so that, you know, no one could challenge me, but I'm still being challenged because I don't have the pen ultimate degree, (laughs) which I think is a needs to be corrected through correct training of current archeologists and those that are coming up, which then comes back again to discussing these issues to the, the students that we had on our field school um, through the Pimo Catalina Island Archaeology Project. Project. Well, but I mean, it is, so it's that and it's, it's bias. I mean, I don't think I've ever had anybody like say to me that, oh, I don't know what I, you don't know what you're talking about because you don't have a PhD, you know, like that is as a white lady, <laughs> you know, uh, it's a very different response you know, like, uh, sorry, just that, like, you know, I mean, I've heard so many people on this podcast. Well, yeah, it wouldn't happen to you. Yeah, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. But, you know, like I've heard so many people say that they got their PhD specifically because they knew they wouldn't be taken seriously otherwise. And so, I mean, it's clear that there's a a difference in experience uh, if you're listening regularly to this podcast, like in the sense of, you know, Obviously, there's privilege that I'm experiencing there. Yeah. Well, okay, we have only a few minutes left. I don't know. I want to talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about... I feel like there's so many stereotypes about Indigenous people and, like, you know, wide open landscapes. And so, like, the thought of uh, uh, Indigenous people in L.A., for example, is very hard for people to wrap their minds around. So can you talk a little bit about what that experience has been like for your community? Maybe bringing in that um, Mapping Indigenous LA project. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's been one of the biggest um, things that we've been trying to educate the public about is the Gabriela Tava are still here. And it is really a disconnect uh, between people who are, who think about LA and think about Native people because those, again, stereotypes don't mesh, just like what you're saying, is that when you think about Native people, they've been taught to think about the prairies and horses and reservations, et cetera. And, you know, that's just not here um, in Los Angeles, except as as the original people of the land, um, we've fought hard to be able to have access to those spots that are special to our community. And we're always trying to find places where we can practice our, our cultural traditions, whether it's gathering tuli or gathering our medicine in places. We're always having to use public lands or, or have relationships with private landowners so that we could go um, and do that collecting. And so it's, it's hard when you're, when you're in an urban landscape because things are paved over, people, things are built over. And so one of the things that we wanted to do, particularly with Mapping Indigenous LA, which is a web resource that was put together in collaboration uh, with a number of Indigenous communities in Los Angeles to talk about just that, that there are Indigenous people that are, are alive and breathing and using and living and continuing to conduct cultural traditions and or have 
reestablish their cultural traditions in a new area and to to talk about that history. And so there, if you go to Mapping Indigenous LA, if you Google it, it's a digital map that was created with the community talking about, particularly with the Gabriel and Tongva, the talking about the sites that are, are special and are overlooked. Um, one of them being Kuravagna Springs, which is on the campus of University High School in Los Angeles. And it was a spot where, as all springs are because of Los Angeles being dry, um, an important place to our community. Um, talking about Pavangna and, and that special place that it has for us because that's where we emerge. But talking about all these different areas so that people can know that these are spots that, that we still use. These are spots that we are consider important and that need to be protected. And the site includes not only maps, but also artwork by Gabrielle and Tongva people and videos. Um, there's a number of videos where Craig Torres, who's one of our cultural leaders, talks about um, how he teaches about Gabrielle and Tongva history, talks about his own ancestors and how his ancestors are descended from particular villages and, and talking about the importance of those spots to our community. And so those stories, making it more public, making it more accessible so people can understand, you know, when you go out there, I'm always saying is that it's not just up to us, the Gabalino Tongva, who are the traditional protectors of the land and the plants and the animals and the water, but those people that live in, in LA as well need to, or have a responsibility to the land, to the water, to the plants and animals to protect them as well. And so it's, it's like we have a special connection to the land, but people who live here, particularly, you know, five generations, there are families out in Catalina that have lived out there for that long. They're protectors of the land as well, and they take that responsibility very seriously. We recognize that people who are living on the land as well, you know, are here now, but we ask for them to help us in that protection. One more thing, speaking of really interesting resources. so. Obviously, we'll include the link to Mapping Indigenous LA, and we're also going to include a link to Carrying Our Ancestors Home, uh, which is also a great resource and I think important, you know, kind of bring us full circle to the the title of this episode, which was Protecting the Hanuk Vitam, uh, which is Ancestors. Um, so I think tying in and just finishing out, maybe talking for a minute about this, this Caring Our Ancestors Home resource, because I'd really like to make sure we we hit on that. Yeah. So basically, you know, I talked about the idea of practicing an indigenous archaeology and pra- being part of an indigenous community includes, again, like I talked about, your responsibility to everything that's around you, but it's also your responsibility to others and practicing in reciprocity. Right. So that you have anything that you have that you're giving back to the community. And the one of the reasons why Carrying Our Ancestors Home was created was because there's a lot of um, practitioners who have done repatriation, both through formal claims through NAGPRA and or um, through cultural resources management, like here in California, where ancestors who are who are found during development there's laws that the ancestor needs to be reburied in consultation with the most likely descendant and so a lot of us have had experiences and have learned a lot as also have had failures and so we wanted to create this platform where people who have had that experience can share their experiences and share their successes share their failures so that they, so somebody who is up and coming and, or somebody who is is doing this now in their job can see what has been done previously or, you know, get some tips from those people, but also to educate the general public and educate museum practitioners or agency officials about what ancestors and their items mean to us as a community, that it's why we care so much about things that are quote unquote dead. You know, there's all of these based on your, your cultural background that some people believe the ancestors are just bones. And so why are you so attached to these bones? They're not real, quote unquote, real people. You shouldn't care about them. So trying to provide these explanations through video testimonials is, is 
one of the reasons why Carrying Our Ancestors Home was was created, um, to share that knowledge amongst ourselves, but also to other people who we are going to need to help us get our ancestors back home. Well, I, that seems like a very fitting place to end in the sense that you talked about, you know, your career really starting with, you know, focus on NAGPRA. And so coming here, you know, to the end and, and finishing with, with such a great resource is fitting, I guess <laughs> we'll say. So I just want to say thank you again so much for, for coming on the podcast. And clearly we could have talked for three, four or five hours because we didn't even get to like two thirds of my questions. <laughs> we'll just have to have you another time. Yep. Well, thank you for the invite. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to the Heritage Voices podcast. You can find show notes at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash heritage voices. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or the Google Music Store. Also, if you like the show, please share with your friends or write us a review. If you have any questions, comments, or show suggestions, please reach out to me at jessica at livingheritageanthropology.org or you can find me on Facebook through Living Heritage Anthropology or on Twitter at Living Heritage A. As always, thank you to Lyle Blanqua and Jason Nez for their collaboration on our incredible logo. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.